Let's look here at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and I, I love the beginning part of this chapter where it talks about, Paul is mentioning how suffering comes into our lives and that we can then go out and encourage or comfort others in the same way that God's ministered to our lives, to us in our, in, in our difficulties. So when we go through a particular trial, trial or difficulty, uh, it has a purpose in it. And in that text, it helps you see that part of that purpose is so that you can actually encourage other people that go through trials as well. Have you ever experienced that before? Uh, you're going through something, another believer comes up and and comes alongside of you and just share some words of encouragement. There's a, there's a way of doing that that really ministers grace. There's ways of doing that that, do, that don't really minister grace, <laughs> but there are ways that minister grace. And uh, especially if they're going to talk to you about how God encouraged them or comforted them in the midst of their difficulty. Well, the second part to this chapter, the Apostle Paul is going to highlight some other ways that God uses these kinds of trials in our lives. I was really struck by this in my reading through this text. I was just reading through it naturally, and I came to these verses, and it just struck me as something that it'd be helpful for us to look at. So let's let's look here at 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, and I'm going to start reading in verse 8. It says, for we uh, would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raiseth the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver." Ye also helping together by prayer for us that the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, I'm sorry, by the means of many persons' thanks may be given by many on our behalf. We'll stop there. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much. Pray that you minister grace to us uh, through this text tonight and that it might even equip us in ministering to others, but it just really might help us to see your working. Uh, how you work uh, in difficulty, uh, in trial, in crisis in our lives. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I have a few questions I'd like us to think through, and I think all of us should be able to identify with these. Can you think of a time when you felt completely overwhelmed? Uh, possibly it would be layer after layer of different difficulties. Sometimes it can just be one enormous difficulty that comes suddenly upon you. I remember when my dad uh, was diagnosed with brain cancer. It came on us very suddenly as a family. Uh, he was in his mid-50s. He was at work. He, everything was normal, uh, except then he started talking and saying full words, but one word would not match with the next word. He seemed kind of dazed. He went out in the large parking lot. I can remember what that parking lot looked like. And it was an older strip mall that they were in. It was just a really big parking lot. And they found him out there wandering around. They took him in and they were doing a CAT scan on him when uh, he fell out of the machine and had a grand mal seizure and his heart stopped. Thankfully, they were able to resuscitate him, but they did find a large mass in his brain about the size of a baseball and they did surgery on that but they gave him just about six months to live and that's how long he lived that initial shock to all of us and even the weeks and months following all the way through for a good period of time was overwhelming it it we just we felt like we couldn't really get a good footing on anything have you ever felt that way? Maybe not something that dramatic, but have you ever had experiences like that? I'm sure you have. It doesn't have to be something that drastic uh, or that much of a crisis, but I'm sure you have. How does Paul's experience in Asia resonate with your own experiences of feeling overwhelmed? Do you see how he describes what he went through in verse 8? How does that match up with how you have felt? 
And then this is an important question. How did you cope with it? How did you handle that? I can remember how I coped with my, that sudden news of my dad. Uh, I can remember maybe three main things. Uh, one is I can remember driving around in my dad's station wagon uh, down one of the main roads. And I think I might have even gone to prayer, though I wasn't a believer at the time, but I just started weeping. I know for that a good period of months, then I just gave myself to distraction through sin and selfishness. I can remember after he died uh, that summer, uh, I can remember being with some friends of mine and toasting a toast to my dad. I can remember those things. How did you cope or how do you cope with difficulties? Of course, I was a young man. I was 17 years old and I, I was an unbeliever. I'm not saying anything right about any of those ways. I'm not, I'm just trying to say, if you looked at your situation, whatever it might be, how are you coping or how have you coped with difficulties? And then looking back as a believer now, looking back, what did you see God do through that situation? You know, it's interesting. I do look back on my dad's death. I, I didn't really mean to tie everything into that, but I look back at my dad's death as something exceptionally significant, even that God used in my life. One is to bring me to Christ. It would be a few years later, but I tied that into my dad's death. The other is, is to really kind of change my traje trajectory. Uh, the other would be to change my character. I was really unmotivated, uh, but... Through all of that, especially through coming to Christ a few years later, radically changed. But what can you see that God has done through the situation that you went through, through the crisis you went through? What did God do in you or through you? Well, I want to look at this, and we are looking at, going to look at simply two main points. What does it mean to be overwhelmed? And then God's purposes through being overwhelmed. And the first point simply is found in verse 8, is going to describe for us. I do think it's important that we note what he's saying. He says, for we would not, brethren, have you ignorant. In other words, he wants to make sure that we know about this trouble that occurred in Asia. But then he doesn't give any details about it. <laughs> he doesn't. Now, possibly he's expecting that they know but he's not going to give details about the events. He's going to give details about what happens in his heart or in the hearts of those he was with. That we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. So what does it mean to be overwhelmed? Well, the basic idea of being overwhelmed is being buried or drowning under a huge mass. That's a frightful thing. Uh, I don't have a good illustration, but I know there are illustrations of people buried alive, people that are caught under large debris of, let's say, a building that's come down, and they were there for a long period of time, dehydrated, fearful, in the dark, in the cold, finally to be able to get free by the help of someone. That's the idea of being overwhelmed, but he's talking about this in a spiritual way. In the text, you have these three uh, statements. We were pressed out of measure. Another translation is we were burdened excessively. It means to be weighed down beyond what could be measured. Uh, the idea, it's to be weighed down, and then you take, let's say, a measurement from here to the back of the auditorium, and I take the weight, and I throw it beyond the measuring tape. I'm weighed down beyond the measure or the capacity to measure. In other words, it doesn't have, it's non, it's, it's not, you're not able to quantify the weight on your soul. Uh, that's the way it feels. Then he says this, above strength, lit literally beyond the power residing in him. Paul seems like a very strong individual in character and in discipline we have every reason to expect that he was. This was beyond the strength residing in him. 
And as much as he despaired of life, it says this idea is that they lost hope. They were utterly, utterly at a loss as to their resources to preserve themselves. Therefore, they were actually under a, a physiological collapse. <laughs> That's the way it felt. Now, it's possible this could actually be a sentence of death, but it could just be that the weight of everything was so strong on them that they just felt like they were going to die. Well, maybe you can't identify with all of that, but can you identify with some of it? I know I can. And maybe that one case of my dad, that's just like one of the real big things that just comes on you and boom. But I can look back and see my Christian experience of issue after, layer after layer of different things piling on top of me and pushing. And the cumulative weight of that is overwhelming. And that's the idea. You will know it in your soul because you don't feel you have the resources or the strength to, to be able to hold that up. You know you're at the end of yourself. Somebody might just break out into tears or cry out to God and just say, I just, I can't do this anymore. That's, that's the idea here. I can't do this. I can't handle it. This is just too much. All those expressions are expressing the idea of the Apostle Paul. But if you look down at it, what exactly is Paul referring to? What happened in Asia that he's referring to? Does anybody know? Any ideas? You can throw a guess out there. Well, you have a lot of experiences. He went through health issues, opposition and desertion by others, threats and danger, loss, burdens for other people, both believers and unbelievers. But it's interesting, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, he does not emphasize the details. When we go to talk with somebody, we spend how much time talking about the details of everything that we're experiencing, right? It's almost therapeutic. In fact, if you went to a therapist, they might want all the details, and even for you to go back into the details, tell me, Eric, what happened when this and this took place? Go through all the details. Where were you? What took place? What did it smell like? What were the colors? They want all the details. He doesn't go into that at all, and it's under the Spirit's guidance. So what is Paul wanting to tell us? Well, one writer puts it this way, and I think it's great. He confesses that he bordered on absolute despair. That's what he wants us to know. He bordered on absolute despair. In other words, all resources gone, all power gone, even unto potentially a physiological, emotional collapse. Now, let me ask a, a question of us. I do want some input on this if possible. What are some truths that we can hold to when we are overwhelmed? What are some things that we can hold on to as a believer when we are overwhelmed that will help us through that? Yeah, David? What's that? Yeah, the promises of Christ. Very good. <laughs> Very good. Yes. Yeah, God's presence, he will never leave me nor forsake me. So even if I am in that collapsed building and all I've got around me is metal and uh, concrete and I can barely breathe, I know he's there. He's always with me. Yeah, excellent. What else? Anything else you got? These are important. Those are excellent. Okay, God doesn't make any mistakes, and that's really linked up to something I have here, that God is sovereign in all of our troubles, right? I mean, you can, we've covered this before, you can cover it, or you can say it either way. You can say that God permitted this difficulty, or if you like, you can say that God orchestrated or brought the, me into this difficulty. You can say either one, both of them underscore the fact that God is sovereign. Either way you want to put it, God is sovereign. Uh, he knows all the details, he knows your personal struggles, and he's more powerful than any situation. What else might there be as far as truths that we can lock on to that will help us when we are overwhelmed? Anything else? Yeah.
Yeah, the all things work together for good. I have not covered that. And that would go under what I have here on God's purpose. God has a purpose, a purpose in you, a purpose through you, and a purpose for his glory. Uh, we didn't really cover, the, well, maybe we did touch on this, but God is always good and God loves you. These would be some of the things. Now, as he doesn't cover the details, as some put it, he covers the theological issues or he covers the divine purpose behind the experience. That brings us to our second point. What are God's purposes through being overwhelmed? And this is just beautiful. I, I have really come to love this text in preparing for this time. I, I don't know why I never was struck by it before. I always was struck by the beginning. In fact, in this Bible, I even have, and I don't know how many years ago I did it, I have every time comfort or consolation in the first seven verses. Every time that's there, I have that highlighted. I don't have any bracket here except a little bit in verse 11. But I've really come to appreciate what's found here. It is rich. These are God's purposes uh, in us or through us or through the situation of being overwhelmed. The first is this, the lesson of faith. Okay, so this is, this is a purpose of God when I am overwhelmed. He intends to use it to work in me a lesson of faith. It's very important. It's key. Look there at verse 9. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves. So we got to the place where we were beyond our own resources. Why? That we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead. So you give me the two points here. What's the first point on the lesson of faith? That we would what? That we would not trust in ourselves. And what's the second point? That we would trust in God. Now, is that's the ABCs of the Christian life. But you know as well as I do, that's where we fail all the time. All the time. I fail in this all the time. I, I know it because I catch myself in the midst of trusting in my own wit, my own resources, my own ways so often. Now, if you look at it here, I just want to read a couple statements about this matter of not trusting in ourselves. Uh, he points out that he did not, as one writer puts it, it was beyond his strength to endure, but not beyond God's grace to fortify him. Another puts it this way, Calvin, John Calvin commented that Paul was no different from other human beings in being tempted to the place his confidence uh, being tempted to place his confidence on his own powers rather than on God. Have you been tempted to do that? Absolutely. Just as I said regarding myself, you know what the greatest danger is? Is when we fail to lay hold of it. When we fail to lay hold of the fact that we are trusting in our own measure, in our own capacities, in our own wit and wisdom. He goes on to say that Calvin reflects this, and I quote, we are not brought to real submission until we have been laid low by the crushing hand of God. So what is the implication of this? Well, we have a natural tendency to trust in ourselves. And being saved, being a Christian, does not change that. That is part of our flesh. When we're with God, we won't have it anymore. But as long as we're in this body, on this earth, in this sinful flesh, with this sinful mind and reasoning and tendency, our first reaction is going to be visible. My capacities, my pocketbook, my strength, it's going to be the resources that I can lay hold of. Now, imagine this just for a minute. Imagine that everything spiritual was visible. And then the crisis comes. Are you going to, I mean, you? if we could personify God for a moment, are you going to go to your wallet? Are you going to go to your own resources and wisdom? Or there's God right there. Are you going to go to him? We would be, we would be leaning on him all the time. The reason we don't is because of these and because of this. 
because of this. It's all, it's all so physical. And so God has to break us of that. What does it mean to you to not rely on ourselves, but on God in difficult times? In other words, what are some things that, that you might rely on that you really should not go to? They might be things God will use, but you, you know you're relying on them with little thought of God. Can you think of some things like that? I've, I've already mentioned many of them. But think about that just for a moment and think about how futile, how vain that is compared to God himself. The second point here is this, so that we would trust in God one writer puts it this way, deep certainty of death for Paul led to a deeper trust in God. Why this statement, where it says this in the verse, it says that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raiseth the dead. Why does it say that? Well, it seems to be reflecting back to really a potential true physiological death. But... Look at it principially. We didn't trust in ourselves, but in God, who, who could meet all the resources of whatever our trial or our crisis demanded. For him, death. He raises the dead. He can meet that. What is it for you? I've got a child that's wayward. Well, what needs to be done about that? The Spirit of God ministering and doing that convincing work. I just had a call uh, here earlier today talking with someone. Very concerning, very concerning about the spiritual needs there. Well, yes, I mean, I can give answers from the scripture and encourage and exhort, but the resources need to be in God. If there's spiritual death or spiritual hardness, I need the one that can break through that or bring spiritual life. And that's God himself. Now, the next one is this, the lesson of hope. So you have the lesson of faith and then the lesson of hope. What is hope for the Christian? Can you give me an idea of what hope is? We've talked about that before. Can you recall some of that or give me your own definition or insight into that? What If you could break up some of the different parts, just give me one definition. What is hope for the Christian? Okay, God's promises? Yeah. What else? Yes, a certain expectation. Excellent. Yeah, that is, that is a, a certain or a confident expectation is hope. Now, let's break it down a little bit, and then I want to go back and read the verse. Hope has this. It's a confident expectation of good. Okay, that, it's implied in there, a confident expectation of good. It looks to the future. In other words, it's something not yet realized. Okay, you're not hoping for something that you already possess. And then thirdly, hope is sourced in God for the believer. Now, with that in mind, let's look at verse 10 on the lesson of hope. Who delivered us, that is God, who delivered us from so great a death and doth or does deliver, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. Where is the hope in that verse? He will yet deliver us, exactly. But do you see how what he just and what they have experienced in being delivered is connected to a stronger, more firm conviction that he will yet deliver? Do you see the connection between those two? There's an inseparable connection in the text. Now, I put it this way, how do difficulties, God's deliverances, and hope work together? 
And when we come into some difficulty and God delivers us, what does that do for our expectation regarding the next crisis? What does it do for it? If, if we just went through a crisis and we were in despair, we were overwhelmed, the building was on top of us, we were drowning underneath the, the mire, and God delivers us from that. We went to God, we were struggling and trusting ourselves, we abandoned that so we were trusting God alone, and in doing so, God delivered us. What does that do for us the next time we are brought under the same kind of struggle when we are overwhelmed? What does it do? Stronger faith, a, a more firm hope is going to build our hope. Can you think of a key verse regarding that? Let's look here at Romans 5. We read it before, but Romans 5, 3 to 5 says this, And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed. Now, Let's work through that a little bit. I'm going to mention, I often don't mention uh, people that I, I quote, but I thought I'd, I'd fill this in a little bit. I was just fascinated by this man, Leon Morris. Uh, I, I thought he was related to the Morris that was part of the Institute of Creation Research, but he's not. Leon Morris is actually, uh, he's passed away now, but he served at, as the head of Ridley College uh, out in Australia. He was born in 1950, passed away in 2006. He wrote some 50 theological books. There, I, I'm sure I have more than one. He's a very common name among excellent uh, commentaries. Uh, his most, uh, uh, the thing that was really known for by those who were around him and worked with him was that the cross of Christ is the central theme to the Christian faith. He was just, he just pounded that into all that he taught and as he ministered to people. Uh, he was uh, also somebody in his day that really fought against uh, a false doctrine regarding God's wrath. There was a strong movement of uh, theologians that were saying that God is not a God of wrath, and he defended that God is most certainly a God of wrath. He did that from the book of Romans. And I'm actually reading this from his commentary on Romans. He says this about this matter of hope out of Romans 5, uh, 3 to 5. He says, the Christian who has been tested has proved God's faithfulness and will surely hope the more confidently, just like we said. That is going to happen. Another man, Douglas Moo, he's a contemporary theologian, still alive, professor and author. Listen to this. I just, I know this is a little bit lengthy, but this is rich about the whole lesson of hope and how when we go through these times of being overwhelmed and we see God deliver, how that works in us a greater confident expectation of what he will do in the future. If we miss that, we're missing God's purposes. It is to break us up from trust, trusting in ourselves so that we will trust in God and it is to build up the confident expectation in our soul. So listen to this. As a result of this tested character, finally, the Christian who responds to sufferings with the proper attitude will find at the end of the line that hope has been strengthened. Sufferings, rather than threatening or weakening our hope, as we might expect to be the case, will instead increase our certainty in that hope. Hope like a muscle will not be strong if it goes unused. It is, in suffer it is in suffering that we must exercise with deliberation and fortitude our hope. We must exercise our hope, our confident expectation of what God is going to do. And the constant reaffirmation of hope in the midst of an apparently hopeless circumstance will bring even deeper conviction of the reality and certainty of that for which we hope. That's powerful. That is exactly what we're looking at in 2 Corinthians. Exactly. He's saying that they were in utter despair, overwhelmed. God used it to teach them the lesson of faith. Don't trust in yourselves, trust in God. And then as he delivered them from that, he did something else. He strengthened them in that confident expectation of good from the hand of God in the next case of problem and difficulty. You ever gone through something again? And you're like, remember what we went through? Remember what God did? Same exact thing here. We can be confident in God. 
The, I think we need to go on just for time's sake. The last lesson is in the lives of others. This is just amazing. This is actually something God's doing through our being overwhelmed. He's doing something in the lives of others. Verse 11, ye also, talking to the church there, helping together by prayer for us. In other words, he's talking to the Corinthians, you prayed for us, that for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, thanks may be given by many on our behalf. The idea of, of helping together is just very simply to work together with someone. And here's the points. Our distressing brings others to seek God in prayer in our behalf. When we are under distress, our distresses, they bring others to pray for us. You ever see somebody go through something terrible and it's just magnified and magnified and pretty soon you find out there's people in other cities, other states praying for that. They get some word about some missionaries overseas praying for that. And it's just, it's just expanding throughout the Christian community. It's engaging far beyond their immediate context. It's engaging other believers in prayer. It, it's engaging them to seek after the one that's invisible, to engage their faith beyond what they can do. Have you ever known that burden to pray for somebody? You can do nothing. They're, they're hundreds, if not thousands of miles away. You can do nothing for them. But you have that confidence and that conviction to pray for them? with a certain hope that God is going to hear and answer that prayer. It engages us and our faith. In Philippians 1.19, Paul talks about this a little bit. He says, For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of God, of, of Jesus Christ, I'm sorry. Prayer is not simply an exercise to recognize and submit to the sovereignty of God. Moses didn't have that perspective. David didn't. King Hezekiah didn't. The apostles didn't. Even Christ did not have that perspective on prayer. The perspective that Christ gave on prayer is that by prayer, you can move mountains or God will move them in your behalf by prayer. That's Christ's perspective. We need to be careful about this. I'm very, I have a very high view of the sovereignty of God. Very high. That does not negate how God created us, this created realm, and how he interacts and works in it. We have not many times because we what? Because we ask not. But when that dear friend is under a crisis, even though they live over in Iowa, it draws me in to seek God. It exercises my faith way over here. And the second point, when God answers those prayers, many are brought to thank God. <laughs> I just uh, got a call last night from some friends, and uh, their uh, son and daughter-in-law have uh, really, they, it's not possible for them uh, because of different health reasons to have children. And I uh, I get this call and they're using some other means for this to take place, but his wife is pregnant. I'm like, that's amazing. And they're going to have twins. Wow. That's just off the charts. If you know who I'm talking about. Please don't say anything. But it just reminds me of this. And I so appreciate my wife. She said, as we were just, I, I remember I just, I told her she was across the room. The other kids were there. And she said, can we just pray? Thank God. Believe me, that couple, everyone connected with them, everyone that knows that situation who has prayed for them is rejoicing in God for what God has done. You know, when we thank God, it does something. It glorifies God, right? It's, it's showing that man didn't do this. God, you did this. It's Everyone's pointing their finger at God and saying, God, you did this. Thank you. 
for your goodness, for your grace. Thank you for your intervention, your love, your kindness, your sovereign plan in all things. Thank you for what you have done. As we close our time, I just have a couple of closing applications. They would be these. Trust God's goodness and sovereignty, looking for God's spiritual lessons in difficult times. Certainly, it would be this, to trust in God alone, to reject trusting in anything of my own doing. Not to say that I don't have part in doing something, but that I wouldn't trust in myself, to trust in God alone. Look at God's past faithfulness and look with confident expectation for his future help. And then seek for others to pray for you through difficulties. That's appropriate. When we come together and we ask, are there any other prayer requests? That's really important. That's very important that we would be praying for one another. I could add another one on there. It would be to thank God when he does hear and answer prayer. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for the time that we could have.